Welcome back to Succeed with Dyslexia. In this series, we discuss news and topics that go on in the dyslexia community. So make sure you like this video, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you don't miss any of our future videos. 2022 has been a huge year for us here at Succeed with Dyslexia. We launched new campaigns to start conversations about dyslexia and its impact on mental health, as well as turning the world red to celebrate Go Red for Dyslexia. We also spoke to experts about the very latest in assistive technology, took a deep dive into early intervention, and even attended our very first show. In this episode, we're gonna talk all about this exciting year. March saw the return of our Drop Everything and Read campaign. From reading traditional books, audiobooks, or even podcasts, it was so exciting for us to see how many of you got involved. We then got the lowdown on all of our latest assistive technology available on the market to support independent reading. We also caught up with our good friend John Hicks, where he spoke about the ways to ignite a love for reading in children. I think the point is, is that whatever, whatever it is you, you write, it's got to be something that is going to be useful in some way to the person who's consuming that content. And it's got to be, it's either going to be a great story or it's got to be um, a, a really good walk through the topic that you're trying to convey. Um, and certainly with, with the blog work that I've done as well, there, there's a question of accessibility um, and, and accessing that information. So, you know, when, when you're doing a lot of online content, you, you, you've got the advantage of being able to write stuff, but you could easily record a video. We're doing a video now. Okay, it's live, but um, it, it, actually, the act of reading is, is really just getting a piece of information into one's head, and it's one of many ways of doing that. Absolutely. Um, and um, I think a lot of people kind of get a bit het up on um, the act of reading, the technicalities of reading. May and June centered all around our new Dyslexia and Me campaign, which centers all around mental health and dyslexia. We explored the stories of those living with dyslexia and how it affects their mental health, as well as looking at what mental health support means to the global dyslexia community in 2022. We spoke to some truly remarkable people who gave us some good insight of what it's like to live with dyslexia. Chris Bosher, a dyslexia advocate, sat down with Succeed with Dyslexia's CEO, Darren Clark, to talk about the importance of breaking the stigma surrounding mental health. People still feel uncomfortable approaching it, which I understand. But if you don't approach it, then things can't get better. I mean, there's, the thing is, I think employees do want the best for you. They will put awareness courses on. They will support you that way. But nothing can change unless everyone in the organization believes in it. As I said, we had mental health first aiders, the company were very pro mental health, just this one individual yeah. wasn't either didn't believe or didn't quite understand it or whatever the reason wasn't, but that put a block filtering it through. Um, but I think it's one thing doing an awareness course, it's the next thing implementing and understanding and being a case of, right, okay, let's sit down. You'll never understand everything. I didn't understand it. And other people going through mental ill health won't understand it. But just being able to speak, say, right, let's find the right support for you. And I think that's the way for you. Don't overthink it, just work together. Don and Elizabeth Wynn shared with us the challenges couples with dyslexia face and the importance of being a team. And what's been amazing in this journey together as we both uh, began to fully understand dyslexia, its sibling conditions and all its ramifications is that we recognize how we truly complement each other now. Because I have strengths that she doesn't. You do. And she has lots of strengths that I don't. And when we actually work together and recognize there's things that I can't do that she can and vice versa, and don't ex and we don't expect each other to have these same strengths, we complement each other. And we together, we, uh, as we were talking about earlier today, we are our formidable force. <laughs> because when, when two uh, minds come together unitedly, a lot more can be accomplished. Yeah, it's, it's really about the love and the respect and meeting each other where we are rather than saying, well, why don't you tick off all these boxes over here? Um, you know, it's not about perfection. It's about showing up for one another and unconditional love. And again, that respect for the strengths that uh, may have taken us both uh, some time to, to perceive because, you know, 
sometimes we're not early bloomers. Sometimes we bloom a little bit later in life. But the point is, you bloom and enjoy the beauty of that experience together. We then spoke with lecturer and researcher from King's College London, Dr. Philip Kirby, all about the origins of dyslexia. What do you think the, the, the kind of the definition around dyslexia? Do you, do you feel that it's changed um, in the research that you've done from you know the history of dyslexia? Do you feel that the definition has, has changed slightly? Uh, so I suppose the biggest change in the definition, well, there have been several large changes. So I think initially it was that transition from kind of ophthalmological research into uh, research by psychologists. So this idea that it was something to do with visual acuity, which you do still see cropping up every now and then, this idea that it might be something about uh, kind of visual abilities, although that's largely been discredited by the science. Uh, but that was originally what was thought, but then that's transitioned into psychology and understanding that it's a kind of uh, developmental difficulty in understanding uh, language in a particular way, or decoding it phonologically. Uh, so that's probably been a, a big shift, that kind of movement towards psychology. Uh, in the earlier part of the 20th century and right up until the middle of the 20th century, there was also the uh, discrepancy diagnostic model, uh, which was very influential. So that was the idea that uh, dyslexia could only be diagnosed uh, where there was a substantial difference between uh, a reading IQ, as it were, and general IQ. So when you see that there's a large discrepancy between the two, that's how you can identify dyslexia. Actually, we know now that dyslexia exists across the kind of intellectual spectrum and spectrum of ability. So that's not a good way of identifying it. Uh, and I think that had a lot of kind of negative repercussions socially, certainly in the middle part of the 20th century, because you saw those arguments, oh, dyslexia is a kind of middle class myth. Dyslexia is something that posh kids have and poorer kids don't have it. They just have difficulty at school. And so you started to see this kind of sense of elitism around dyslexia, certainly in the middle part of the 20th century because of that diagnostic model. But as that's been superseded in the science, so I think we started to see a fading of that uh, idea that kind of dyslexia is a middle class uh, disease, as, as many of those arguments in those earlier decades uh, would have had it. Now it's time to head on over to the beautiful Shropshire countryside, where Joe Fowles embarked on a bit of green therapy and how that has helped countless individuals on their journey. So it is actually combining that full circle of your physical well-being and your mental well-being. And to do so, I think walking whilst nurturing yourself in nature is the classic circle. And it's, I think you've just, you mean it releases endorphins, doesn't it, when you walk? Hugely. So add to that the, the talking side of the therapy. And I think it's just, it's such a natural thing for us to do. More natural than stepping foot inside a stranger's office and sitting down and in that situation and being like, I think there's a pressure on what to talk about sometimes. Yeah. And people come out, I don't think I've got anything to say. And I'm like, you'd be surprised you have. Dr. Jenna Kenyani joined us for a powerful interview where she talked about her experiences of dyslexia and mental health. It wasn't until sort of about maybe three years ago uh, I decided to pay for some private therapy. I was still struggling. I was going through dips and it's the job. It wasn't just the job anymore. There must be other things going on. Um, and so I paid for, I was very fortunate I could afford to pay for some therapy. And just by coincidence, the therapist that I ended up getting um, happened to also be dyslexic. And I can only describe that moment as life-changing. Um, she just got me in a way that uh, other people hadn't really ever got me. Um, and I started to realize that so many of those issues that I had had in my work life and in my personal life and my mental health, so much of them had actually revolved around being neurodivergent and seeing the world in a different way. But not just that, constantly feeling different, constantly feeling like I wasn't good enough, had had this massive impact. And she got all of that like no one else did, but it was more than that. She didn't just get those feelings, she also got how my brain worked. We started being able to talk um, in pictures, not just in words. So when I when I was trying to explain to her how I felt about something, I might explain it with a description of, of what that looked like in my head, like what the image came to me. And she would kind of describe things back with another image. And for someone that isn't neurodivergent, I think that sounds really kind of um, obscure, but 
for me, it was like I'd met someone that spoke my language. It, it was, it was honestly, it was like one of the the, the most kind of breakthrough breakthrough moments. Yes. Yeah, it really was, and um, and it, and it's really like I since that moment, like I definitely my mental health is, has been. Um, impacted finally in a positive way. I finally fa finally feel like um, therapy is actually working for me. So far, so much incredible stuff, but we're just getting started. As we moved into the height of summer through July and August, we turned our focus over to early intervention. We chatted with Paloma Ford about the impact early intervention can have on dyslexic lives. Early intervention, how, how important do you, do you feel that is? It's so important. Um, anyone who knows me or follows me on social media, I'm literally screaming and shouting it most weeks. Um, and the main reason is, is I still think, even in this day and age, there is massive confusion about the difference between having a screening and having a full diagnostic assessment. So if I had a pound for any time anyone asked me that, I think I'd be a millionaire by now. And um, I think that's where the problem lies because a lot of schools are communicating, not all schools, uh, are communicating to parents that there's nothing that we can do until your child is eight, uh, which is simply not true because um, many, I've got a Facebook, um, I've obviously got my Facebook page, but I've actually got a community uh, dyslexia support group, which has got quite a few lovely parents on there. And I was actually asking them this weekend, because I knew I was doing this interview and I said, Please, can you tell me how old um, your child was when you first had that niggle? And I, I must have uh, had a good hit actually on Facebook with the algorithms because everybody was jumping on it. So I had a really good reach, 95 comments. And I'd say the average age was about three, three and a half that parents knew. Um, but you can actually, um, and I think that's the problem because sc schools just think we can't do anything until the child's eight because that's when you're going to get a diagnosis. Where actually, if you're spotting these signs and you're seeing those signs really early and it is a gut instinct. I've always said, like when I was a Senko, I was a Senko for many years. I used to say to teachers, if you have a niggle, you must tell me because if you don't voice it, there's nothing anyone can do. So it's really vital. Educational consultant Lorraine Peterson joined Donna Stevenson to provide her expert view on the UK SEND legislation and its impacts on students and schools. As I said, back in 2014, we had a new Children and Families Act. So, um, and part three of the Children and Families Act is, is all about children with special education needs and disabilities. So everything is actually enshrined in law when it comes to getting support for children and young people and their families. Um, on the back of that, in 2019, um, it, the government decided that we needed to have a review. It was five years on, we needed a review. Unfortunately, because of Brexit and because of COVID and because of changing ministers, um, we didn't actually get anything about a review until earlier this year. So at the end of March this year, we got what is a green paper. So a green paper is a consultation document and it's, it's looking at what the future of special education needs and disability will look like going forward. Now, there's been lots and lots of debate at the moment, well, there still is actually, because we're, we're still in consultation period, about if the reforms that had come in in 2014 had actually been implemented properly, we wouldn't need another green paper now. So there's a, there's a lot of dispute at the moment about do we actually need change or do we just need implementation properly of, of what we got? Some of these conversations have been absolutely amazing because it's not just us as individuals who might have dyslexia, but many parents who have dyslexia have children who have dyslexia as well. We spoke to Caroline Smith about how to best support your dyslexic children when having dyslexia yourself. Cool. I think the problem was that when she does the national tests, she just follows the line that goes up. Occasionally she might drop or go up and down, but there's no massive drop or drop at or goes really high or really low. So therefore it was never alerted through that there was a problem. And when you go back and look at the test, yeah, it does go like this. 
But because of that, I think she's sort of managed to slip through the net, which makes me think there must be so many other children out there that are the same like that. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, wow, Caroline, what a journey you've been on. And like you say, I know that you appreciate how lucky you are to have a loved one in your life who is an expert. And it makes you think about all those other families yes. who don't maybe have no. you know, um, a family member who knows about this stuff, who've got yes. concerns. And I know this is why we wanted to talk like this, yes. to kind of get this, uh, these ideas out for others. So how did it make you feel then as a mom? When you've got these concerns about your daughter initially, before you'd gone to, you know, um, your mom and asked her about her uh, thoughts on whether your daughter's got dyslexia, but for you as a mom, when you're going to school and they say, no, 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 it's fine, what would you have done, do you think, at that point, had you took that at face value? And also, how did it make you feel now when you look back and think, well, actually, unfortunately, they were wrong? I think the problem is that I was diagnosed when I was seven and that, that was because I could not read at all and I, I still probably haven't ever read a book which is really bad but I've never read a book or well, never... We hear that I've, a lot from adults Yeah with and I, I mean I've tried, attempted to but I don't understand what I'm reading, I don't read at all ever, um, I can skim read, I can look at pictures, I can listen to audio but I can't read a book and then take in information and understand what I'm reading, that's the main thing. So for me I'm really really bad and my major worry is that I just didn't want my children to be like me because I've had to live with this and try and get round it in all areas of my life up until now and I just didn't want them to have the same problems that I did so I think if I didn't have my mum I probably would have we wouldn't even know that this was a problem and I would have kept going oh she's fine she's following along the line you know and we would have got to GCSEs and thought wow why can't she do this so I'm really pleased that now we are taking steps in the right direction yeah um, so the school are now helping in that they are trying to do more one-to-one -one with her which has been great but again I had to really push for that and I know a lot of schools won't do that or you have to pay extra to do it. We also had the opportunity to speak with Liz Lowley who shared some of her great tips for engaging positively with your child's school. One of my key bits of advice and I have to be a hundred percent honest here and say I know I didn't always get this right that communication with school is so important and at secondary school I believe I have got that right um, and I'm lucky that my son's school have been willing to communicate with me and really and understand the importance. At primary school, although I had a very good relationship with many people at his primary school, I talked at his primary school part time. As a parent, I let my frustrations sometimes, sometimes I'd say it wasn't a bad thing because it drove things forward. It got him um, some of the support he needed and slightly change the ways of thinking um but at times yeah i i just got too frustrated and couldn't deal with it and there was even a meeting where i had just had to walk out and uh leave his dad to kind of carry on because i thought this i can't deal with this because it was so emotional to me and i think that's one a big bit of advice for parents try and communicate with the school positively accept that you are going to be emotional it's a very emotional thing um, and that's okay you're allowed to but remember the school isn't against you. They are trying to help as well. Sometimes they don't have the knowledge that we would like them to have. Their time is limited. They've got so many other things to do, but don't go to meetings with school expecting a battle, but do expect emotions to come about and that's okay. Um, but I think if you can get that communication with the school and work together, on a child's strengths and so much of what you know about your child from home will be useful for the school to know. And of course, we had the Go Red campaign during Dyslexia Awareness Month in October. We delivered conversation starter sessions about inclusivity in companies around the world, working with our friends over at Twinkle to create a Go Red resource pack all about the importance of inclusive thinking. We also had a discussion with some VIPs, which was very, very insightful. And here's what they had to say. It's a very interesting question because I know I know me and you have had conversations in the past with other people about that when you are dyslexic, do you need to have a day or a week or a month that actually is promoting you uh, where actually we should be being promoted every day of the year anyway? So that is a question, uh, that is a conversation. But I think that 
it, it what Sue said, it kind of does. It, it really thinks on what you're doing. It kind of gives, it gives the wider community and not, the, I think, more than the dyslexia community, opportunities to talk about it, opportunities to kind of do things. I think it gives that opportunity. And if we go back, like I, for me, when I was what, when I was 14, no, even, I think even younger, when I first rang the BDA up to ask for for some for for, for, for information about Dyslexia Awareness Week, and they sent me these posters, they sent me these leaflets. And in my school, we had it literally, if you walked in, there was a poster display of Dyslexia Awareness Week. And when I was in college, I put the word Dyslexia Awareness Week in, in the college uh, uh, like reception on, on, I printed out the, the thing so everyone could see it as they walked past. So it, it does focus the mind that actually the, that yeah, we've got what 6.9 million people in the UK with dyslexia, give or take. But actually then there's still 69 million people. I think that's right, the 10% concept. That still need to know about it because like sue said it's it's a strength it's it's not just the negative side of dyslexia we've got to we've got to promote that positive side that, and like sue said breaking down barriers i think it's a brilliant term this campaign was really something special because more of you got involved than ever before and together we turned the world red and got everyone talking about dyslexia by lighting up buildings everywhere so thank you and despite all of this amazing stuff we've been able to be a part of, we also reached out globally to have some amazing interviews with people all around the world. And so many of our friends provided us with an update on the dyslexia landscape in New Zealand, Bali, and Kenya, just to name a few. It's Andy Carroll, I'm originally from UK, and I would say the best way of describing myself is I'm an activist in education, and I'm wanting to shine the light on dyslexia and what support that we can we can offer the the, the Balinese children um, on the island of Bali. My name is Firis Muni from Dyslexia Organization Kenya. I'm the director and founder of Dyslexia Organization Kenya. So let me give you sort of context about New Zealand. We don't have any legislation. There is no legislative framework in New Zealand like your Equality Act. The first time I came to the UK, pardon me, I heard about your Equality Act and it seemed to me to be quite transformational for the UK. Um, and I have to say, I looked at that with a lot of envy um, because we don't have that in New Zealand. An exciting addition to the Succeed with Dyslexia family happened this year too, with our much anticipated Workplace Services Department, which will provide services to support both organizations and individuals in the workplace. Here's our Head of Training and Assessment, Donna Stevenson, to tell you more. Launching our new Training and Assessment Department this year at Succeed with Dyslexia is one of our most exciting developments. If you'd like to find out more about the services that we offer, please do visit our website pages and click on the information. We offer training for individuals and organisations around dyslexia and other neurodiverse differences, and we can also help you by providing a diagnostic assessment or a workplace needs assessment as well. We look forward to hearing from you. Throughout 2022, we brought you four Dyslexia Learning Festivals. Hello, my name is Katrina Cochran. I am a specialist teacher, specialist assessor. So hi, I'm Julia from Succeed with Dyslexia and I am so happy to have incredibly important guests with me today. We're at the point where we can talk to kids read to kids. Hi everyone, welcome to the panel session for the Dyslexia Learning Festival of Australia, sponsored by Scanning Pens. My name's George and I'm from Spelled New South Wales. We have with us in our panel, Samantha, who's from Learning Links and Ashraf, who's here from Spelled Victoria. Welcome to you both. Hi everyone, it's Donna Stevenson here and I'm Head of Training and Assessment at Succeed with Dyslexia. It's great to have your company for what I hope will be a really interesting deep dive into what does a dyslexia friendly workplace look like. Hello and well, welcome to, to my talk for the Assess with Dys Dyslexia Co Conference on neurodiversity and mental health in the workplace. 
including our very first Workplace Focus Festival in November, hosted by, of course, Donna Stevenson. We were joined by some amazing guests from across the globe, providing their insight about teaching techniques for dyslexic learners growing up with dyslexia in today's world, and providing information on assessments and workplace needs. You can access all of our festivals free and on demand by signing up at dyslexialearningfestival.org. This past year, Succeed with Dyslexia also spent some time on the road. We exhibited at our very first show at the Dyslexia Show in March. And here's a little snippet of what we got up to. Would you believe that it was two years ago that Aaron had all the ideas, actually probably three years ago, that Aaron had the ideas of creating this incredible show, which was the Dyslexia Show, to serve the dyslexic community. That obviously had lots of different problems with regards to COVID, but he is absolutely delighted to have launched today the Dyslexia Show. Now we're going to go in there, we're going to speak to some incredible people, um, I'm going to be carrying out a, a talk, we're exhibiting, Succeed with Dyslexia are exhibiting there, there are so many incredible people that are all there to help the dyslexic community. So follow us in there, enjoy what we share with you and also if you've attended the show please let us know in the comments and we look forward to speaking with you. So I'm here with the founder of the Dyslexia Show, Aaron Smith. Aaron, can you tell us a little bit about the show? Well, it's just been amazing. This is we're day two. Uh, we had an amazing day yesterday. So the show was created to be the UK's first national exhibition dedicated to dyslexia, uh, supporting education parents in the workplace. We finally did it. it. Was meant to happen in 2020, of course. We had the pandemic. It didn't happen. We kept all the people the book sessions. We kept all the exhibitors. We transferred them over to this year, and we've just got a bigger and better event. Uh, it's amazing. It's been. Uh, it, it's. I, I like. I think I said to you earlier, Darren, I went outside on, on, uh, on our build day and looked at the sign being put up and I nearly cried that we actually did it. So there you have it. 2022 was an amazing year for us here at Succeed with Dyslexia, but only because so many of you incredible individuals got involved to help us spread more awareness about dyslexia. And if you've been with us for a while now, you do know that we come out with a new episode every single month for this great cause. You just watched episode 21, and you can click here to view episode 20 to learn a little bit more about what we got up to this year. That being said, we are so looking forward to 2023 and all the amazing experiences that we can have together. Once again, thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next year.